Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Good morning to those of you who are on Zoom, telephone, however you drew in this, this praise and worship service. We are so glad that you're with us today. And I'm just asking you to just be focused and keep your mind on the Lord and hear what the Holy Spirit is saying this morning and just move by the Spirit of God today. So I want to declare today that this is the day that the Lord has made. <clears throat> and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we come boldly before your throne of grace this morning to praise you, to worship you, to glorify you, to exalt you, magnify you, to honor you today. We come, Lord God, to recognize, Lord God, that you are the keeper of our souls, Lord God. And God, in you we live, we move, and we have our being, Lord God. We come this morning, Lord God, in the power of your Son, resurrection in the name of your son Jesus. Lord God we come this morning to bless you Lord God. We come Lord God this morning to stand in the gap, to bind to loose in Jesus name we come Lord God to declare your word today in Jesus name Lord God for your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path health to our navel and marrow to our bones. We come Lord God this morning standing on your promises, Lord God. We come this morning, Lord God, in the name of your son, Lord Jesus. We come to bind, Lord God, every demonic spirit, every imp and every demon. We come, Lord God, in Jesus' name, Father God, asking you, Father, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you will bring deliverance to those that are battling with drugs. You will bring deliverance to those that are battling with alcohol. You will bring deliverance, Lord God, today to those that are in captivity, those that are in bondage. God, you will bring salvation today, Lord God, to those who don't know you today, Lord God. God, I pray, Lord God, this morning that those of us who came today, Lord God, in whatever condition we came, God, we will not leave the same way that we came. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, God, I ask, Father, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you will look upon every soul today. You will look upon every situation today. You will look upon every circumstances today. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Father God, I ask today that your will be done, that your kingdom will come. Father, I ask today that you will look upon our praise and our worship ministry today. Father, I ask today that you will look upon those that are going to break the bread of life in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask today that you will bless us, God, as we commune with you, as we fellowship today. Father, I ask today that you will mortify the deeds of our flesh, circumcise our hearts in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, I ask today that your word, Lord God, will not return back void as you send it forth, Lord God, to accomplish, Lord God, what you want to accomplish today. God, I ask today that you will open up our ears today, that we will hear the word of God. Father, I ask today that your word, Lord God, will go down in our hearts in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, I ask today that we would humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God in Jesus' name. Lord, let your will be done. Lord, let your kingdom come in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, fill us again with the Holy Ghost. Father, pour out the Holy Spirit. Father, refresh us today in the name of your son, Jesus. Father, we cannot do nothing without you in the name of your son, Jesus. Lord God, we ask 
by the power of the Holy Spirit that you show up in this service today in Jesus' name. You move today by the power of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Lord God, have your way. Lord God, let your will be manifested. Let your will be done. In the name of your son, Jesus. We declare, we declare today, we declare today that no one will lead the same way he or she came. We declare today by the blood of Jesus that no one will leave Lord God with a desire to, 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 to smoke dr drugs in Jesus' name. We declare, Lord, that you would get the glory. We declare, Lord, that souls would be saved today. Souls will be saved today. Souls will be saved today. Souls, Lord God. Jesus came for souls. And we declare by the power of the Holy Ghost that souls will be redeemed today. Redeemed and washed by the washing of the word. Redeemed and washed by the blood of Jesus. We declare that to take place in this service. We declare, Father God, because you've given us the power to declare, to establish to call those things as though they be. And so, Lord, we thank you. 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 Hallelujah, we thank you. Hallelujah, we thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are your servants. We're your representation. We're your hands extended. We're your mouthpiece. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that all things are working together for your good. For those who love you and call according to your purpose. Lord, we thank you. Touch us today. Touch us today. We need a touch. We need to be touched. Power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I stretch my
This is the part where we are. We share the life, the legacy of Jesus. <laughs> I remember as a kid, you know, they used to pass it around. And um, I didn't understand it then, you know. I was like, man, these crackers and grape juice, what is? What in the world is this? I'm just a little kid, I didn't know. Well, I don't want no crackers and grape juice, you know. But now, and the reason why I'm saying this is, my eyes have been opened. Father God, speak through me today. Have, do it your way, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's go over to 2 Kings real quick. I was, <laughs> you know, I, I had one thing I wanted to say. I wanted to do something on faith. But the Lord showed me this this morning. And I said, okay, Lord, I see what you're saying. Because he's done this to me. He opened my eyes. See, I thought I was seeing, I thought I was seeing God. I thought, I thought the way I was seeing him was it. <laughs> you at home, you think you know God. Not yet. Let me show you. Let's go to 2 Kings. Chapter 6. And we're going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's see here. This is, I saw this and I'm like, okay, Lord, I see what you're doing now. Because Okay, let's let's start in uh I'm not gonna go to let me start in uh to cut this down a little bit. I'm gonna try to start it in. Let's start in 12. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 12, and it said, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Now, hear me. Elisha is a product of Elijah. Elijah, he was, a, man, he was a bad prophet. But Elisha is too. Elisha got a double portion of what Elijah had. This man bad. He can see. But is he Seeing through his natural eyes, or is he seeing through his spiritual eyes? Come on, talk to me. How, how, what is how is he seeing this? How can he see what the other king that want to take out the Israelites? How can he see what the other king is planning? How? How? How does he know what this king is talking about in his bedchambers? Ooh. 
13, he said, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. They want Elijah, uh, uh, Elisha now. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. So the whole bunch of folk. And they came by night and compassed the city and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen and gone forth, behold, a host compassed, compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. Now how in the world could he see that? In his natural eyes, he wasn't able to be able to see that. Watch this, 17, and Elisha prayed, <laughs> whoa, God, I love, man, I'm telling you, man, these prophetic passages, man, encourage me. They encourage me. And he said, I pray thee, open his eyes. I love it. I love it. Elijah is, he ain't worried about what he saw. Elijah, Elijah said, I, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire around about Elisha. Let's go over to Acts chapter 9 real quick. See, we, man, we got natural eyes. I can see you. But we have spiritual eyes too. Eyes from the spirit. And I'm, I've been asking God. Lord, let me see into the spirit. Let me see. Let me see. We have to understand that it's a deeper, darker, deep, darker, deeper, darker level that God flows in. See, people, especially y'all at home, it's another level. Ask God to open your eyes. Watch this. Acts 9, let's go to verse 8. Now, let me just bring this to, uh, this is about Saul. Saul persecuted Christians. Paul, Saul uh, uh, kept, kept some things going, but now it's time for him to deal with, with God. <laughs> you see, it wasn't nothing he could do with him. He couldn't handle what God had for him. <laughs> All he could do was submit. Watch this. Let's go. Let's go to verse 8. Now, after God... Well, let me, just, let me just back up a little bit. Let me start at four. And he fell to earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And trembling and astonished, 
and trembling and astonished, the Lord will and said, What Lord wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and you shall be told thee what to do. And the men journeyed with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, and seeing no man. Eight. Then Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. It's another way to look at this thing. And I'm, I'm starting to understand that our televisions, magazines, computers, that stuff can be a major, major distraction. We need to desire to see things as God sees them. Because none of us are who we are in heaven, who we are now. None of us. See, God got a whole nother plan. You at home, God got a plan for you. See, see, you see yourself in the mirror and you see what has happened to you over the years. Stop looking like that. Ask God who you are. Let you see. Because watch this. When he opened Saul's eyes and he changed Saul's name, Saul came into who he really was. Who you are in God is who you really are. Oh my God, this thing, man, whoa. We, who, man, let me, let me, my God. Let me wrap this up. People, we are powerful, but you got to, you have to get out of being who you are in the flesh and let the spirit, God's spirit lives in you. You got to let him, you got to, you got to let him walk. You, we walk, we, listen, walk by sight. We walk by the Spirit. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is so powerful. The fruit of the Spirit over there, man, I, I begin to look at that and get, begin to see it and God begin to show me when you start to function in that, you become beautiful. Look at the fruit of the spirit. Look at, look at all the attributes that come from that. Paul, eyes was open. <laughs> and God got busy with it. Andrea, sister, God got something for you. You spoke the other day, the leadership meeting, I was listening to you, and I saw somebody totally different. Totally different, Andrea. 
God is going to, I want to be there. I want to see that. I want to see it when he do it. Because your humility is going to allow him to pour his spirit on you so heavy, Andrea. Humility. Your humility. And you're going to soak it up and then you're just going to start pouring it out on people. Powerful. Powerful, powerful. It's the same thing he did to Saul. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. That's how powerful. He used him powerfully. He wanted to do the same thing for us. Get your condiments. He want to do the same thing for us. I'm looking at, I'm looking at people. God is going to change you. Powerful. He is going to change you. See, it's not. See, it's it's not that we need a, a lot of work, but when you get the word down in you, the word does the work in you and through you. It's the word. The word is alive, y'all. I don't know how many believe this. It's alive. Just like we taking communion today to, to identify and to say, hey, God, thank you for your body and blood. Start eating this. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for for dying, and then coming to live in us. (laughs) Woo, God, we love you. Amen, amen. amen. All right. We're going to take a few more minutes and share from the word of the Lord. I was speaking this week with uh, Brother Charlie Stromer, and we were talking about the move of the Spirit. It's not only breaking out now in America, it's breaking out in England as well. It's breaking out in various places across the globe, and the Holy Spirit's already been moving in other nations before it even came here. So we were talking about different categories that the Scripture uses to discuss when the Holy Spirit moves powerfully among us. number of different words. There's revival. There's renewal or refreshing. And there is visitation number of words that are used, and we were just talking about some of the differences. First of all, when we speak of revival, and what we want to do is is look to the Scripture. And Scripture speaks of revival. To revive means to bring someone back from the dead to make them alive again. Revival would be something similar to Ezekiel 37. Go with me there to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Obviously, bones speak of death. 
Then the Lord caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. The Lord is raising a question in the heart and the mind of the prophet, just as he raises questions to us and then asks us, what's the answer? Ezekiel's answer at this point is the right answer. You, Lord, you know. You ask a question to me, not because you don't know and you don't understand and you want me to tell you. You ask me a question because you want me to say, I don't know the answer, Lord, but you know the answer. Revival always starts on God's terms. Revival always starts where our lack ends. God's life, God's power, God's move begins. So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, the Spirit speaks, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. Not only will the bones live, in other words, the bones will be revived, the bones will come to life because the Lord will breathe on those bones, but then the Lord will put, he continues, sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who makes things happen. We, we've taught that before, that the phrase, then you will know that I am the Lord in Hebrew, and, it, and the Lord says this frequently to the prophet Ezekiel in his book, means you will know that I am the Lord who makes things happen. That's the essence of the word Yahweh, the Lord who makes things happen. It, 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 it is from the same language, linguistic pattern when the Lord spoke to Moses on the mountain with the burning bush. He spoke out of him and he said, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you're going to declare to Pharaoh and you're going to declare to my people my name. And Moses says, what is that name? I am that I am. And I am that I am in Hebrew means I am the God who makes things happen. And the, 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 the phrase, I am the God who makes things happen, is the root for the word Yahweh. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh. You shall know that I am the Lord who makes things happen. He's not just a God who did things many years ago. And we have faith in what he did. And we're constantly looking back to what he did. All of that's true. All of that's legitimate. All of that's the part of the word. But to really know the Lord is to know the God who makes things happen. He made some things happen back then. He's been making things happen from then till now. And he's going to make things happen today. Not only does the Lord revive the dead bones, not only does the Lord give life to the bones, but then he constructs form around those bones. God does not just in revival bring the dead to life, but then he forms those that he has brought back from the dead into life and he puts form upon them, skin and flesh and sinews and breath within. He creates them to be able to accomplish his purposes. Now, it's very important to understand, you know, Ezekiel is going back and forth in the book of Ezekiel between 
Babylon, where he's exiled, and Jerusalem, where he once lived. The Lord is taking Ezekiel in the spirit back to the land from which he was taken, the land that the Lord leveled, the land that the Lord broke, the land that the Lord dismantled. And he's taking him back, and he's causing him to understand that everything that God does, there is purpose to it, and there is purpose in it. The answer isn't, yeah, the Lord dismantled Jerusalem because he got sick and tired of Jerusalem, so get on with your lives. The Lord, even when he dismantled Jerusalem, was to prepare it to walk in his purposes. Before, though, God builds up, God tears down. We're going to go back to Ezekiel 37, but go to the first chapter of Jeremiah right now. Jeremiah's call as a prophet. Jeremiah 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God sets in motion his purposes for us in the womb of our mother, which means God sets things in motion before we exist as a human being. And if God sets things in motion before we exist, fulfilling God's purposes is not up to us. It's up to him. He has set it in motion. We are called to enter in to what God has destined and decreed for us even before we were even born. See, this is, this is what Bird is getting at. We, our spiritual eyes have to be opened up to see. There's a lot more going on than just what I understand. What I understand about myself what I understand about the future, what I understand about God's purposes. There is more. And where it is hidden, if you will, is in the heart of God, in the mind of God, in the will of God. And to really have our spiritual eyes open, it's to recognize, behold, the psalmist says, Psalm 139, which is a parallel passage here to what the Lord is doing in Jeremiah. Behold, you covered me in my mother's womb. Our eyes have to be open to see what God sees. It's one thing to see the Lord. It's one thing to see what's going on around us, but we have to see what the Lord sees. And revival says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. For God, see, when you're in the womb, do you know God? No. No. But God knows you. See, see what, is, what is less important is what I know, and what is more important is what he knows. And when he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, basically he's saying, before you were even fashioned and formed, I had a purpose and a destiny and a life and a reality mapped out for you. And you need to understand that. You need to understand you haven't come into this world to make something of your life. You have come in this world to see what I have destined for you to see. And in the call, a real, a, a true prophetic call, again, Bird talked about it. Do, do we recognize what happened in Acts chapter 9? When... Saul saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. What happened to him when he saw the Lord? He was made blind. To see the Lord is to be made blind to the world you have created around yourself for yourself. Paul was extremely religious. 
he understood the scriptures extremely well. He was very accomplished in what he thought was the purpose that scripture laid out for him. But he didn't know the Lord. And so he is a self-made religious man. And so what the Lord has to do, before you see what I see, you have to be made blind. See, that you have to understand that. See, God disassembles before he assembles his purposes. He disassembles us. He disassembles what we think is God's purposes, how we think God's purposes are, when we think God's purposes are, what we think things should look like when God's purposes are being fulfilled. All throughout Scripture, if you look at the heroes of faith, the Lord breaks Jacob before he renames him Israel. The Lord Let's Abraham and Sarah wait 80 some years before they enter into their destiny. Moses starts his ministry at 80. Remember Moses, the, the idea behind Moses, per Charlton Heston, is Moses, and this is actually, this is stated, in some of the ancient Hebrew works was that, remember, Moses was a Jew, and remember, the Pharaoh was putting to death all the baby boys, and remember, Moses' mother sends him out into the Nile in a, in a, a little boat that she constructs, and the little boat floats, and who adopts Moses as her own son, Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's home. Now think of how, think of how inheritance goes. Pharaoh's daughter would be the first heir to succeeding Pharaoh and who would be the next heir? Moses. Moses was supposed to be the next pharaoh of Egypt. That's starting off pretty good, wouldn't you say? Going from being sentenced to death to being now the heir to being the ruler of, at that time, the greatest nation of the world. And you know what the Lord says? Nope. It's not what I have planned for you. So at 40, as Moses is in the prime of his life, the Lord tears Moses down. And he, he flees to the wilderness. He's 40 years old. Well, okay, Lord, you tore him down. He's 40. Now at least he's in the wilderness and he becomes a shepherd. Well, now at least, you know, a couple of years after that he can enter into, nope, 40 years as a shepherd, tearing him down more. And then at 80, he calls Moses and says, it's time. See, the Lord disassembles before he assembles. Jesus Jesus is disassembled before he's assembled. Jesus' job is to be the Messiah. He's sent into the world to be the king of the Jews, the king of the universe. But guess what he's got to do first? He's got to be executed by the Romans. He's got to die. Do you understand? Jesus is being disassembled. Satan took Jesus up to a mountain at the start of his ministry, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and basically said, I'll give these all to you if you bow down and worship me. The devil understood Jesus' purpose. Jesus understood Jesus' purpose. He was going to be king of the universe, Messiah, Lord, ruler, son of man. He's got to be disassembled first. He's disassembled in the fact that his family rejects him. He's disassembled by the fact that Rome rejects him. He's disassembled by the fact that Israel rejects him. And finally, his own disciples leave him. 
That's a disassembling, brethren. The cross represents this. Before God builds us up, he tears us down. Oh, Pastor Oz, why is it taking so long? That's not, it's not long as far as God's time is. This is what revival is. He tears us down and brings us into the valley of the shadow of death, and then he builds us back up on his terms. Why did it take Moses 80 years to find out the difference between his own terms and, and God's terms? Because Moses was a mighty man. He was a strong man. Our strength can work against God's purposes. The stronger an individual is, the more difficult it is for him to do it God's way. Because God's way is, in weakness, my strength is made perfect. In your inability, he moves. Rejoice in your inability. Pastor Oz, I keep praying and nothing's happened. Rejoice! God's bringing you to the place of Jeremiah. He's bringing you to the place of Ezekiel. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37. And he is preparing to move powerfully in your life. He is not preparing for you to move powerfully. He is preparing you to move powerfully in your life. This is the basis of revival. We have been praying for revival since the Jesus movement. We went through a revival. And, and you know what, what, what did all the young people do to make the Jesus movement the Jesus movement? Nothing. Nothing at all. We kind of stepped into it. We just stepped into the sovereign work of God. And you know what we stepped into? A move where others had been praying for 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years, they had been praying, they had been sowing, they cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent rain. That's revival. Those of us who have been praying since the Jesus movement for another Jesus movement, it's going to happen. God's going to do it. And the young people are going to step right into it. They're going to step right into it. And we're just going to sit there and rejoice in the Lord. But it's going to be like it happened with Ezekiel. But before we do Ezekiel, let, let's, let's go back to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So God's knowledge precedes ours and takes precedence over ours. Before you were, sancti before you were born, I sanctified you. Oh, sanctification is when we work out our uh, holiness in God's life. No, sanctification takes place when the Lord determines sanctification before we're even born. It's got nothing. What, what does it have to do with you if God set it in motion when you didn't even exist? Nothing. See, this, this, this is why faith, apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. Those of you who are working on your holiness, keep working till you fail a few more times. Those of you who believe God, those of you who say, faith, I will put my faith and trust in the work of the Lord, that's where the sanctification gets released. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. When we really begin to hear and see what God is saying and what God is doing, when we begin to hear and see, here is the greatest sign that you're really hearing and seeing the Lord. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. The clearest sign that somebody's really seen God is the person says, there's no way in the world I could do that. You've seen God. As long as you think, oh, I can do that, you haven't seen God. 
You're listening to the beat of your own heart. You're listening to the beat of your own desires, which the Lord says, got to take a little longer with this individual. Got to break those desires. Because when they see what I'm really going to do in their lives, when they see what I've really called them to do, they're going to say, I can't do that. That's what Moses said. After those 80 years, 40 years in the wilderness, he's 80 years old, the Lord calls him out and says, Moses, it's you versus the most powerful nation on the earth. You're going to win. He says, I don't know. Ask my brother Aaron to do it. I can't do that. I, I can't do that. And this is the guy 40 years earlier. Remember why he got exiled from Egypt, why he ran? Because he woke up one day and realized he wasn't, a, he wasn't an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew, and he saw his people being mistreated. And he, and, and, and he saw an Egyptian mistreating his people, and he slew the Egyptian. He was passionate for justice, and it's okay to be passionate for justice, but he took justice into his own hands. So Moses went. Here's spiritual growth in Moses from being the guy who says, oh, I'm going to be the Pharaoh anyways. I can do whatever I want here. I'm strong. I'm powerful. I'm young. This was spiritual growth. He went there in 40 years and saying, I can't do anything. And that was spiritual growth. The day you realize you cannot do anything is the day God is ready to move in your life. The last, the last three years, remember, I mean, we remember everything we did at Lord of the Harvest, and it was powerful, and it was flourishing, and but Pastor Oz, I can bring all kind of different people together, and I can just bring the unity out of it, young and old, white and black, rich and poor, male and female, I can do it, I'm Pastor Oz, and then three years ago, I was like, this thing's finished. This thing's over. This thing's done. Okay? The church had a lot of people in it. At one time, this church, as I said before, had 180 people in it. The Lord said, eh, that's about 150. Too many for me. Gideon. Remember the story of Gideon? Gideon had a, a great number of individuals the Lord was raising up Gideon to lead a great number of individuals to come against the Midianites, the enemies of God's people. And Gideon said, well, I, I, I got a decent-sized army. The Lord said, it's too big. It's too big. Cut that army down. Lord, it's too big. What are you talking about? We're fighting Midian, and we're just a bunch of peasants. Give them 10,000 of them. If 9,000 of them die... There'll be at least a thousand of us left to celebrate that. No, the Lord says, no. No. And three years ago, the Lord showed me. I just said, boy, have I failed. I was able to bring all these people together, and I was not able to sustain the work. And the Lord goes, that's right. You can't. You never could do it. You thought you could do it. You thought that's the, well, what an apostolic anointing is, to be a big shot. Do you know at Asbury, the spirit that was moving there at that college? Do you know that some of the biggest name worship teams, biggest name five-fold ministers, biggest named Christians, all wanted to come in in Asbury and lead the worship and speak and, and, and preach the word. And the heads of that college, they, all they were called to do was just shepherd it. The Holy Spirit did it. They were called to shepherd it, and they said, thank you very much. No, thank you. They shut every big shot in the nation down. Why? Because this wasn't about human beings. This was something sovereign that the Holy Spirit was doing. Now that's a change for American Christianity. 
So the Lord counters our saying, see, to say, ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak. I am just a child. See, that's reality. Jeremiah has a realistic view of himself. He has a realistic understanding of what God wants done through him. And he said, no way in the world. That's reality. See, reality begins in revival. Reality begins in true ministry with the words, I can't. That's where revival begins. I can't. Because in order to be part of a move of God, you not only have to see the Lord the way he is, you have to see yourself the way you are. And see, this is the problem with American Christianity. American Christianity runs Christianity like, like you're the CEO of some big shot company. Well, where are they all now? Where are all the big shots? Where are all the presidents of the United States. Where are they? Where are all the big senators and the big House of Representatives and the big CEOs? This is the thing that cracks me up. Nobody could, nobody could stop COVID. Nobody could stop it. It, it. it came on people unawares. Nobody could stop it. You know what the Lord was doing? He's just, he just humbling people. Nobody can fix the racial tensions that we have in this country. The civil rights movement, which was raised up by God, came close to at least focusing in on what was needed to be done. And yes, there have been great advancements in, in, in civil rights and things, but I, I remember uh, before the pandemic, going to a, a national conference with a predominantly African Americans, and this was post 2016, if you get my drift, and they were old enough to remember the civil rights and their interpretation of what was going on in our country goes. It's worse than things were before the gains in the civil rights. It can't be done. Human beings have no answer. And then, now we have, and I've, I've told you what our good friend and brother, Taylor Cox, says. He says, right now, he goes, his concern in this nation is not the strife between white and black Christians. He said it was at one time. It's not anymore. Between white Christians and Christians of color. He says, the, the, the thing that's worse right now is, am I a blue Christian or am I a red Christian? He says, that's way worse than am I white or black. The political division. People are now more loyal to a political party agenda than the word of God. So guess what? The Lord is humbling America. The Lord is humbling the church in America. Why? So he can revive us. Trust me, revival is coming. Now we're also going to talk about in the future the difference between revival and renewal. And then we're going to talk about the difference between revival, renewal, and visitation based on Scripture. I, I, I had a whole message planned for visitation today. I was going to do a, talk a couple minutes on revival, a couple minutes on renewal, and then get into the real heart of the matter, why I am praying that this is not a revival, not a renewal, but a visitation. But you know what? It would have taken too long, and I'm not going to keep you longer than we've already been today, and we've already heard God speak. All, visitation will take in the best parts of revival, the best parts of renewal. So I'm just talking about revival right now as a prelude to visitation. I will sum up the difference 
between the three and why I think visitation is the most important, just briefly in a few minutes. But let's just finish Jeremiah 1 and Ezekiel 37. Do not say, see, the Lord says, this is what I've got for you. I say, I can't do that. And the Lord counters that and says, you're right, you can't do it, but I can. That's revival. We, re revival is we have to face the fact that we are a valley of dead bones, but the Lord can raise us back up. Do not be afraid of their faces, he says. Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. There's Emmanuel. I am with you. Emmanuel means God with us. I am with you, he says. As he said, I'm with. He told Abraham he's with him. He told Moses he's with him. He told David he's with him. He told the prophets he's with them. He told Paul he's with them. He told John he's with them. And he tells us he's with us. That's the important part. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, see, Ezekiel says the hand of the Lord was upon me. See, God's hand has to be upon us. God's hand has to be upon our mouth to, for revival to be affected. Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. And watch. First of all, you root out. Second, you pull down. Third, you destroy. Fourth, you th throw down. See, there's the dismantling first in revival. And then finally, you build up and you plant. There's a, a demolition and God raises up something that is of his glory. The Greek word in the New Testament to visit, for God to perform a visitation as opposed to a revival and opposed to renewal. The Greek word, which is episkopeo in the New Testament, that Greek word translated the Hebrew word Pakad. In verse 10, it says, See, I have this day, and the Lord uses the word Pakad. I have set you over the nations. I have visited you, and in visiting you, I have given you the charge, given you the office, given you the authority. What a visitation does, and, and Ezekiel is primarily about revival. Jeremiah is about revival, but it has this element of visitation as well. When the Lord comes to us in person and commissions us with his authority to go forth and heal, work miracles, bring salvation, bring judgment, bring life, that's a visitation. A revival is where God takes what is dead and makes us alive. Renewal or refreshing is where God takes what's already there within us and he renews it. He visits it again. He causes us to re-experience on a fuller level what he's already done in our lives. Revival is to take the dead and make them alive. Renewal is to take what God has planted in us and raise it up a second time and raise it up a third time and raise it up a fourth time so that it goes from 30-fold to 60-fold to 100-fold. A visitation is when it's just like the word visit. Well, I'm going to go visit somebody. You, you appear. You go in person. A visitation is when the Lord comes in person and creates within us an authority to carry out his purposes. He says, 
to Jeremiah in Hebrew, see, this day I've visited you, and in that visitation, I have given you an authority. I have commissioned you over nations, kingdoms, to root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down to build in the plant. When we experience revival, he, he brings us from death to life. When we experience renewal, he builds on what he's sown in us and he, he builds it up to a greater capacity. But a visitation means exactly what it means. When Jesus came in the first century to Israel, he said, this is the day of your visitation. The Lord himself appeared personally to them. I'm praying for a visitation. We're going to be made alive again. We're going to be renewed. We're going to be refreshed. But what I am hoping for and praying for and believing that what we are about to see take place is going to be a visitation. Now, it's funny that I'm telling you about something that I'm not really developing it. We'll develop it another time. But let's finish back in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. The Lord has commanded him to prophesy to the bones. And the Lord is saying, when you speak my word, it's going to bring what is dead to life again. Now, when Ezekiel is transported from Babylon back to Jerusalem, and he comes to this valley of full of bones, what exactly, you want to talk about dismantling, you want to talk about putting to death. This would have been a mass graveyard of Hebrew soldiers who are massacred by the king of Babylon. <laughs> you can't get any more dead than that. They were massacred by the king of Babylon who came in, destroyed their people, destroyed their defenses, destroyed their cities, destroyed their temple, and they're being left there to rot. That, see, that's, that's adding insult to injury. It was a horrible, horrible insult for bodies not to be buried. It would be, it's the same thing today. It's the same thing today. You bury your dead to honor those dead. So it's, it's dishonor added to dismantling. And so when Ezekiel comes, he, this is why he's like, I don't know what you want me to do, Lord. The soldiers were executed because they did what? They disobeyed you. See, again, this is, this is to me as American Christianity. If you fail, fired, written off the show, thrown off the island, who cares? That's, that's America. America is, that's demonic. It's demonic to, to, to just treat human beings as if they're not human beings. Every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. And you, that's the world writes people off. But see, the church has gotten like that too. Well, you don't, you're not following our doctrines. Write them off. Oh, you, you didn't. You're not living righteously like I think it. Write them off. And here's what the Lord is saying to Ezekiel. Ezekiel said, they're written off, Lord. What do you want me to do? You executed them for their disobedience. The Lord says, prophesy to them. I'm going to raise them up. See, that's the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles, as I've said before, Judas wasn't the only one that betrayed Jesus. Every single one of them betrayed Jesus. Jesus said, I'm raised from the dead. What am I supposed to do? Well, I'm going to go breathe on them. See, that's, that's what Ezekiel does. He breathes on them. Remember in the upper room in the Gospel of John? What did Jesus do to the disciples? He breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's saying, dead bones rise. I'm not counting anybody out at this case. You can't count anybody out. 
because the Holy Spirit's going to come in revival and he's going to raise the dead. And there's some people who are less righteous than we are and they might get raised from the dead and you might not. And you know why you might not? Because you were arrogant and you just proclaimed judgment. The Lord revives the dead. He makes them dead, but then he revives the dead. So I, I've also, I mean, I've spent so many things these last three years doing, and one of the things that I've, I, that where God has dealt with my heart is to say, you never know who I'm going to raise from the dead. So, you know, don't, don't pass any final judgments on even your brothers and sisters in Christ whom you believe, and maybe rightly so, are idiots and heretics. You might be right that they're an idiot. You might be right that they're a heretic. But I raise idiots and heretics from the dead. And don't be in a place where I raise the idiots and the heretics from the dead, and you, the know-it-all, gets left behind. And I'm speaking this from a standpoint of saying, I, I, I understand who the idiots are. I understand who the heretics are. And I understand it because I've been given that gift from the Lord. That doesn't ma- I don't care whether people believe that or not. I, I, know what, I know what God's done with me. He put in me a gift of discernment to understand the difference between the spirit of falsehood the spirit of deception, and the spirit of truth. I I had a supernatural encounter over 50 years ago, and the Holy Spirit declared to me what he was going to do with my life. And he's, he's, he's been faithful to it. And I see it, I get it, I understand it. But it, it doesn't put me in any kind of place of advantage. Your gifts, the gifts that you have are from God. They're grace gifts. That doesn't put you in any position of advantage before the Lord. So you can discern truth from falsehood. So what? God can raise up a donkey to do that, which he did with Balaam. Because, so, so you're a great worshiper of the Lord and you recognize uh, what people who don't know how to worship. Well, God can raise up worship from the stones. So what? See, if, if your gift somehow gives you an advantage over somebody else in your heart and mind, you're deceived. Your gift doesn't make you anything before the Lord. The Lord can snap his finger and shut that gift off and you're finished. Who cares? It's about the Lord. It's about his purposes. It's about When I do this, then they will know that this is the purpose of why God does things the way he does. So people will know I am the Lord who makes things happen. I don't see my name in that that, that description anywhere. Oh, and they'll, they'll know that you're a great apostle and prophet. I don't see that in there. What I see is, I don't see anything there. Oh, I'm such a, I've been so hurt and wounded by others and I can't wait till those who hurt and wounded me get theirs. I don't see that in it anywhere. I don't see that in, in there anywhere. What revival is, is he gives us the ability. Like Ezekiel, if we are working together with the Lord, he gives us the ability to bring life to the dead. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these slain so they may live. Now see, it's a play on the fact that the word ruach in Hebrew means spirit. Ruach means breath, and ruach means wind. It's the same word. To prophesy to the wind is to prophesy to the ruach. 
To prophesy to the breath is to prophesy to the ruach. To prophesy to the spirit is to prophesy to the ruach. The ruach hakodesh is the Holy Spirit in Hebrew. And what, what, he's, what he's recognizing is that in the wind, in the breath, in the spirit, God's whole cosmology is summed up in wind, breath, spirit. God's heart to make things that are dead to live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Stop and think of it. This is what Ezekiel's called to do. There's a valley of dead bones. There are soldiers, slain soldiers, whose skeletons are in that valley. Ezekiel, as a Hebrew, lost family members. They were slain. They were put to death because of the disobedience of the Jewish people. There are soldiers who were defending against the Babylonians, and those soldiers would have all been spared if they would have submitted to the word of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel are, are, are contemporaries. So he is raising from the dead individuals who caused his loved ones to be executed. You got that? Revival's going to come, and some of the people that have done the most damage to you, you are going to be required by God to speak a word of life over them. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready to do that? Well, here's a way you can get ready is the people that you dislike right now, stop disliking them. See, this is what I've had to go through the last few years. Those idiots, those heretics who are screwing who are screwing with the minds of God's people. And I have loved ones, loved ones whose brains have been screwed up by the idiot, heretic Christians promulgating their conspiracy theories. You know what the Lord says? You love those people who are promulgating those conspiracy theories. You may have to speak the word that raises them from the dead. Oh, I'm telling you, the Lord, the way his plans work, he messes with us big time. He messes with us so that we get to the place where we see people the way he sees people. He loves people. He loves people. He says, okay, Ezekiel, now, these soldiers that put your loved ones to death that are the reason why they were executed, I want to raise them from the dead. Speak to them. See, Ezekiel's hesitancy has, isn't just like, oh, I don't really understand this theologically. No, you understand this exactly what's going on. Are you willing to embrace my heart? The Lord's so far beyond do you have the right theology, do you have the right spiritual formation the Lord's so beyond that he says but do you understand my heart Jesus is Ezekiel's called what what was his name the son of man as the son of man he's on the cross and he recognizes I'm dying because of all these idiots and heretics I'm dying but you know what I'm going to prophesy to the dead bones here. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And it said, and when he had said that, when he breathed his last, he gave up his spirit. See, Jesus' final thing before he died, he blew his breath on the dead bones and he offered his spirit to the Father. Can you do that? 
Will you do that? Think of the person right now or the persons that you are the most angry, most hostile with. You say they're idiots and they're heretics and they've, they, they're messing with me. They're messing with my loved ones. And what you need to do to show that you're a man and a woman of revival, breathe your breath on them and say, dead bones live. And revival will begin. Then he said to me, son of man, verse 11, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Israel had, it was destroyed. It's completely dismantled. It's removed from the land. They're in exile and they're grieving over their dead. And they're saying, we're next. Therefore prophesy to them and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who makes things happen when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. See, the real return from exile is when you begin to say, you know what? The church is, is in exile because of the idiots and the heretics, but I'm part of that church, and I'm in exile too. We go into exile together, and we come out together. We don't go into exile, some of us, and some of us come out of exile. No, we go in together, we come out together. Then you will know, then you shall know that I, the Lord, I, Yahweh, the God who makes things happen, have both spoken it and done it, says the Lord. And it's 1230 and I should quit, but let me just show you John 5 in this perspective. John 5, I always quote these verses, okay? I quote them constantly. 519, Gospel of John, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. And I always teach, we need to see what the Father's doing, like Jesus. And then verse 30, Jesus says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear the Father speak, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And of course, I say, let's have a theology where we see what the Father's doing and we hear what the Father's saying. And it's possible to those who believe. You, you, you remember, Jesus prays for things, and it always is whether he, he's multiplying the food or he's establishing the Lord's Supper. It says he looked up to heaven, he blessed it, he broke it, and he distributed it. He always looks up to heaven first. It's like, before I do this, Lord, what do I see you doing, Lord? See, he always stops. Do, do we do that in our situation? Do we, before we do something, do we look up to heaven and say, what are you doing, Father? And see, if you look up to heaven and say, what are you doing? You will see. If you turn your ear and say, before I say something, what are you saying, Father? You'll hear. But in between seeing what the Father does and hearing what the Father says, look at verse 20. What, 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 what's, what's the in between this? Verse 20 says, The Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead, for as the Father raises the dead, for as the Father raises the dead, 
the Yahweh, the God who makes things happen, is a God who primarily, his primary ministry is to give life to the dead. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. What does Jesus see the Father doing in his ministry? Raising the dead. And he says, Son, go raise the dead. Verse 24, most assuredly I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. It's taking place right now in the ministry of Jesus. It, just as it was taking place right then with the ministry of Ezekiel, preaching to the dead bones. Most assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What does it mean to see what the Father's doing? He's raising the dead. Go raise the dead. What does it mean to hear what the Father's saying? He's given you authority to raise the dead. So in whatever situation God brings you into, with broken relationships and with addictions and with idiots and heretics and with, with, with preaching the gospel and with setting people free. It's always about go raise the dead. A person who's dead in their foolishness, a person who's dead in their addiction, don't execute them. That's the job of the king of Babylon. You're not the king of Babylon. You're, you're a kingdom of priests under the Most High God. Go raise the dead. For as the Father has life in himself, verse 26, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And I've given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, of judgment. Listen, raise the dead. That's your job. The Lord will take care of the rest. The Lord will take care of the rest who are, have been raised from the dead and, 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 and work out their lives in the fear of God like 11 of the 12 disciples. And if they're Judases, that's, that's in the Lord's hand. There are Judases. I understand this. I understand that not everybody gets it right. But that's not your job. Your job is to prophesy to the dead bones that they might live. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. And what is the will of the Father who sent me? That everyone that God gives me I'll raise them up from death to life. Lord, revival is coming. Renewal is coming. Visitation's coming. We'll talk about visitation another time. We talked about revival today. Revival says that we are called to bring life to the dead. Renewal says that we're called to build on the work of God that he has placed in each one of us, Lord. We'll do that too. But visitation, Lord, it means you come in person. So come in person, Lord. But in the meantime, we'll bring life to the dead and we'll build up those, Lord God, who have been gifted with grace and we'll build on that so that they can be renewed and refreshed. Grant this unto us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. The call is real simple today. The call is going to be a personal one.
just follow the call. Lord, right now I want you to bring an individual, a family, might be a church that really hurt us. It might be a group of, of, of heretical idiots, Lord. But you bring someone to each of our hearts and minds that we have great, great, great hostility toward, Lord. And the call is that we would, each one of us would pray for that person to come to life from the dead, to breathe on them in the power of your prayer. And we'll watch and see. Thank you, Lord. You just sent me. I was like, who do you want? You just sent a person to me. I know who I'm going to pray for. Holy Spirit, do the same with everybody else. Send that person, and, and we're going to take a couple minutes silent prayer and we're going to pray for that person to come to life from the dead in Jesus' name. Amen.